Hello, my readers and writers. I have a blast from the past for you today. I wrote this post a few years ago, and I just wanted to share it with you today. So take a seat, relax, and listen to this gonzo story I have for you called Steve Buscemi and My Love of Monsanto. Bear with me. A powerful hunger hammered me at 3 a.m. in the City of Roses. My go-to food spot had closed about 30 minutes ago. I thought I was doomed. On a whim, I decided to check Google for any 24-hour places in downtown Portland. I was new to town. To my amazement and shock, there were actually two. There was Voodoo Donuts, which I talked about in a previous post. It was in a part of town where you were going to get robbed at night, especially holding a pink box. Period. No doubt about that. There was, also, there was another place, though, that sounded pretty good. It was the Roxy. I would actually heard of, it, heard of it before on a TV show I really like called Leverage. Add on the fact that it was just a block down the road from where I was at. It was kind of by Powell's. I live kind of on the edge of the Pearl District. The next block over is colloquially called the Glamour District. This area had shops with names like Spartacus, which sells sexy lingerie, and furniture places that had guaranteed organic wood furniture. There was a club that I had walked by one night and thought for sure there was a T-Rex on the rampage with the crazy amount of bass that was coming out of it. All in all, though, I had just thought the Glamour District was a tourist trap and hadn't really been down there much. The Roxy was in this area. The Roxy at 3M is a people watcher smorgasbord. All types of drunken hipsters. I'm pretty sure I was the only sober person there other than the staff. The staff was really amazing. They are allowed, maybe even encouraged, to be sassy with their customers. Not quite rude, but definitely not taking any guff. I had exceptional service, and after puzzling over the menu, ordered the Steve Buscemi breakfast, which is the corned beef hash he orders in Reservoir Dogs. Remember the whole conversation about the tip? The Roxy was definitely guilty of the cutesy menu. An affliction all of Portland seems to have. After living there, yes, two years of it, always. I had been so focused on all the crazy people that I hadn't really looked at the decor. I was amazed at all the pictures of famous people on the wall. I had never been to a place like that. When I looked, I thought for sure I'd find two Wong Fu, thanks for everything, Julie Newmar, but did not, sadly. The other decor was very hipsterous and very LGBT friendly. There was also a lot of liberal stuff on the wall. I drank in the scenery and enjoyed it very much. Then my heart skipped a beat. On the wall, there was a traffic sign that said, Dear Congress, please stop Monsanto. I really wanted to say something, but as the Roxy has a policy of giving baby bottles to customers who complain, I decided against it. Besides, I've tried to converse with anti-Monsanto people before, and their responses have been at minimum ill-informed. And at maximum short-sighted. I had to laugh to myself, though, as most of what the Roxy served which was genetically modified or made by Monsanto. Let me explain. Most of what they served at the Roxy, and pretty much anywhere, had corn or derivative corn as an ingredient. I was sitting at the counter and looked through their condiments. This held true for all of them, except maybe the salt and pepper, I don't know. Corn always has been and will be a genetically modified organism. It was a GMO when the first Europeans laid eyes on it. To this day, we have no idea how the Native Americans were able to do it. Somewhere and sometime in Mesoamerica, natives used techniques which we cannot recreate to, recreate to this day. There's a type of grass that looks like a tree that might be the closest cousin to corn, but even that is up for debate. Uh, Charles C. Mann's 1493 has an entire chapter dedicated to explaining this. It is superb. Anyway, I, to my chagrin, must admit that I went through an anti-GMO phase myself. It was short-lived because a relative put me in my place quite handily. My reasoning was that our ancestors would be upset by the unnatural GMOs created by the labs. My family member responded by saying our relatives would roll in their graves right now from hearing me say that. But why? Well, you see, people, since time immemorial, have been hungry. Like, really, really hungry. Like, pretty much all their life was dedicated to getting more food. 
And here I was saying how it was evil that we were getting more food. Really? Yeah. My relatives, your relatives, everyone's relatives would do just about anything to get more food. So why are we villainizing that now? GMOs happen naturally all the time in nature. Take the sweet potato. There are all types of genetic code in it that is not native to the sweet potato. Somehow, through many generations, sweet potatoes picked up some of the genetic material of the other plants in the field. My source on that, Bill Nye Podcast, Star Talk. So anyway, and he grew on that subject. Um, continuing on. This is not surprising because when you plant a garden, a lot of times you end up with some hybrid mutants. For instance, if you plant cucumbers next to pumpkins, you get crazy pumpkin watermelon hybrids. Hybrids. I've, even, I've seen this with my own eyes. It happens with squash and cucumbers also. Think of the earth before mankind as a giant garden. All types of plants growing next to each other. All the same. Thus making a soup of shared genetic material. There really is no such thing as a pure cu- cucumber or a pure sunflower. It is all genetically modified by Mother Nature herself. I have also seen in Portland some signs that vilify the way corn syrup is made. I say to this, if we didn't have corn syrup, we would have to depend more on foreign sources for our sugar instead of growing it here in the good old U.S. of A. So, there is that. And as far as vilifying how corn syrup is made, well, that reminds me of seeing the failed attempt of anti-abortionists on the campus of the University of Northern Iowa. Not touching on that subject, but hear me out. Uh, It'll make sense in a second. At UNI, anti-abortion activists would occasionally ambush students with pictures of fetuses and stuff trying to gross people out. I was leaving Rod Library one day, and there they were in all their glory. They nailed the student in front of me with crazy gross pictures. His response really summed up uh, the the failure of this tactic. This This is what the kid said. So, I'm pro life, but those pictures are stupid. Farm kids know that anything that comes out of the body is gross. Try talking to people. You're not going to get anybody here with that. So anyway, now apply that student's statement to the villainization of corn syrup. Oh, but look how gross corn syrup is to be made. To which I can only say that your stomach, yes, go worse, uses a hydrochloric acid to digest food. You use that to pickle steel, my friend. Digestion would look and smell gross if we saw it on a large scale. So, yeah, the way they make corn syrup is gross. But relate that to the way your stomach digests that frappuccino you are drinking right now. I see it. And make no mistake, and those of us in the Midwest, farmers especially, remember the lessons of the Dust Bowl. There is an eternal temperance that the Dust Bowl branded onto the ethics of farming. New farming techniques and over-farming caused the Dust Bowl, which many people believe was the end of the world. During my time working as a bartender at the Moose Lodge in Washburn, Iowa, I talked to many people who had lived through this dark time. They had stories about how they would dust the whole house at the beginning of the day, only to have to clean several inches of dust off everything again before dinner. People actually burned corn for heat because that was more bang for your buck than selling it. To think that farmers have forgotten this lesson is disrespectful to people who you depend on for your sustenance. Well, Mr. Idiot, we should just go all organic and then everything will be okay. No, not quite. So I remember one year for the corn maze, I wanted to grow pumpkins organically and sell them. After some research, I found out that pumpkins have a 90%, 90, 90, 90% crop loss if you go organic. So the question is, if you go organic, have a 90% crop loss, when you have to plant 10 times the amount of crop, thus 10 times the amount of land needed, the crop loss comes from the bugs and pests and disease and other things that are routinely treated by things that Monsanto can take care of. With this in mind, if you are munching on an organic apple right now, why are, you, why are you eating this apple? Well, the bugs didn't decide not to. Why? What do they know that you don't? The crops that are consumed by insects and pests still have to be watered. The organic, pharma, organic farmer still has to fertilize. The lost crops consume resources for no harvest. There's been a source of puzzlement to me that the states which are most pro-organic 
are also the states that are having the most trouble with droughts. The West Coast is literally on fire right now. This was a couple of years ago. And they are the most in favor of pro-drought organic farming. I don't think it would be as big of a waste of water in Iowa to go organic because they don't need to irrigate. How do you know if a cornfield is irrigated? I learned this on the airplane out to Seattle the first time. Uh, rectangle fields tend to be non-irrigated. Knew that. Circle fields tend to be irrigated. Didn't know that. Let's be clear. There is nothing and never has been anything natural about farming. The second you start cutting down trees, clearing land, plowing the soil, planting seeds, etc., you are telling Mother Nature that you know better than her. Civilization began because of this, so be thankful of your arrogant ancestors. You go ahead and enjoy your drought encouraging, no pesticide, non-GMO, Monsanto-free bug sandwich. I'll eat some really awesome corn-fed beef at a really cool diner called The Roxy at 3 a.m. in the City of Roses. Well, thank, well, thank you for listening to that. Um, if you liked it, uh, please like and subscribe. If you really liked it, have a look-see at my Patreon link in the video description. Until next time, I'll be writing, and hope you are too. You're right on when you're writing on. Peace.